going to turn to Andy and ask her to um, give us an introduction to this project. Andy? Thank you, Paul. I'm delighted to introduce this guide and to highlight the National Endowment for the Arts 19-year partnership with the National Governors Association, the NGA, and NASA. Since 2001, with support from the Arts Endowment, we've produced a variety of issue briefs and reports on topics important to state governments, primarily centered on aspects of state economic development. This latest release, Rural Prosperity Through the Arts and Creative Sector, responds directly to governors' requests for innovative and effective strategies to help their rural communities gain a stronghold in the new economy. So many rural communities have been beset by loss of industry, by out-migration, and rising poverty costs, poverty rates. The communities that have been able to leverage their arts and cultural assets have seen notable successes. And this guide provides a path forward, offering action steps for states and communities to consider. Here at the National Endowment for the Arts, helping all communities achieve their full potential is a priority for us. We provide broad access to funding opportunities through our direct grant categories, and this is particularly important for organizations in rural communities that might lack local public or private funders. Through our ongoing partnerships with the nation's state and local arts agencies and regional arts organizations, we're able to reach even more deeply into smaller and rural communities for maximum impact. And then in addition, we have several specialized programs that focus on rural communities. I'll highlight three for you. Our Citizens Institute on Rural Design brings together rural community leaders in multi-day workshops to address design issues important to them. And then in 2017, a collaboration between the Endowments Research Team and the Economic Research Service at the Department of Agriculture yielded a report called Rural Arts, Design, and Innovation in America. It looks at the relationships among arts organizations, design integrated firms, and businesses, and business innovators in rural settings. And lastly for today, our Our Town program assists communities of all sizes, including many very small rural towns, to integrate arts, culture, and design into development efforts that strengthen communities. In fact, the program's online resource, which is called Exploring Our Town, features eight rural-based case studies, including one for a town with a population of only 20 residents, and four tribal community-based case studies, along with lessons learned that highlight best practices. With this new guide, we're building on prior rural efforts and proud to make available new research on the value of arts and culture to rural economic development. The guide has only been available since mid-March, and already we're hearing from the field as to how you've been using it to open doors and hold conversations with potential new partners. The NGA team has been broadening the rural arts conversation too. They've been connecting our research to their colleagues in other NGA divisions, bringing it to an expanded universe of state policy experts who can help bring awareness into their respective sectors. Most of you listening are very familiar with NASA and their fine work, so I'd like to take a minute to talk about our NGA colleagues. They're analysts in the economics division of NGA Center for Best Practices. If the center is reporting on the value of arts and culture to rural communities, you can be sure that 56 state houses across the nation are going to be paying close attention. Sally Root from the center will lead you through the finer details of the guide. Before I turn the floor over to her, I want to reiterate how proud the National Endowment for the Arts is of this publication and of our deep and productive partnership with NGA and NASA. Take it away, Sally. I'm really delighted to be on this call with you. As Andy mentioned, I'm Sally Root from the National Governors Association. So you all are all the experts, and why am I on this call? Next slide, please. To partially answer that question, I'll start by telling you a little bit about my organization. The National Governors Association has been around for more than a century this photo is of the first National Governors Conference, which is what NGA was called until several decades ago. Teddy Roosevelt, who had been a governor himself, first brought together the governors of the 39 states at that time, 1908. 
In my role at NGA, I staff the governor's economic policy advisors and governor appointed heads of commerce organizations and heads of state economic and community development agencies, sometimes called EDOs. Next slide, please. And I'm in the NGA solutions organization uh, part of the house. And this is the old NGA Center for Best Practices. We just rebranded this past week, Andy. <laughs> um, and more specifically, I'm located in NGA Economic Opportunity, which encompasses several policy issue areas, workforce development, post-secondary education, state human services, and economic development, which is the area that I lead. On certain policy areas, NGA's policy-oriented groups work hand-in-hand -hand with other NGA groups, and rural is an example of one of those cross-policy topics, which I'll talk about uh, some more in a second. Next slide, please. To continue with some additional background for the webinar, we have 22 new governors setting up their new state administrations this year. And there's lots going on at NGA around that. We also have a special focus on rural challenges of solutions at this time. And uh, several examples are sh shown on this slide. Um, for NGA Health, for example, access to treatment in rural areas has been one of nine focus areas for governors as they address a, the addiction crisis in rural areas. Uh, and they don't have addiction specialists in those rural areas for, for the most part. So uh, primary care physicians are consulting through teleconsultation and telemedicine um, approaches. And the NGA Environment, Energy, and Transportation team, a current project on electric vehicles, has a special focus on rural issues and equity because rural citizens can't access charging stations without broadband and 5G. For NGA Economic Opportunity, helping rural areas take advantage of the Opportunity Zones provision from the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is a current challenge as 40% of the governor-designated zones are rural with little experience working with private investors. So those are just examples of some of the work we're doing to help rural areas, and we believe there are a number of ways to help rural areas in uh, rural America overcome its challenges and its needs for uh, population, infrastructure, health care, educational institutions, industry, and other needs. Next slide, please. So given that broad approach, NGA entered into a partnership with the National Endowment for the Arts and National Assembly of State Arts Agencies to document and share information on how rural areas can benefit from the creative sector in arts and culture. Next slide, please. The three partners combined forces to do several things. First, NASA did a 50-state scan and other research a lit review, a study of quantitative data sources, um, and other research. Second, we engaged national experts through an NGA roundtable in the spring of 2018. And third, the three partners produced a rural action guide for governors and states. Next slide, please. I should also add, as Andy did, that NGA's partnership history with NEA and NASA extends back a ways and we've jointly shared information on a variety of related topics as depicted on this slide, which shows some of our recent reports we've jointly produced. So back to the topic at hand, why did the team, why did we team up on the current topic? Next slide, please. The Census Bureau, as you probably know, has identified some 18 states as rural states. Meanwhile, BEA, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, has identified the contribution of arts and cultural production to the economies of those 18 states. And it's more than 67 billion. As examples, uh, the value added to North Carolina's economy exceeded 14 billion, or 28% of the gross state product, and 120,000 jobs. Next slide, please. 
Continuing on why NGA teamed up with our partners, additional research by USDA's Economic Research Service, which Andy mentioned, and NEA, shows that rural counties home to performing arts organizations experience three times the population, higher household incomes, and more recession resilience than other rural areas, along with faster employment growth as measured by when there were more design businesses, there was more job growth. Next slide, please. So that was at the county level. At the business level in rural counties, it was found that where there's art, there are more innovative businesses. Next slide, please. As a result of the USDA and ERS research, and based on input from the experts roundtable I mentioned, and with the help of excellent staff all around at NASA and NEA, the partners came up with a rural systems change framework that identified the state roles in this arena. And by state roles, I mean state roles that go beyond the purview of the state arts agencies alone. It includes the Office of the Governor and other commerce-related activities at the state level. The Rural Systems Change Framework is organized according to five activity areas or roles for states and governors, and they are provide leadership, capitalize on cultural assets, and this is something Pam Rowe at NASA has been emphasizing a lot, build the state infrastructure for partnerships, develop local talent, and create an environment friendly to investment and innovation. Given that I would rather hear from the audience on this call on their input and questions on each of these areas, I'm not going to dwell on the specifics of each of the ingredients of the systems change framework, but I'll just mention an element in each area. Next slide, please. For the first area, providing leadership, it's important for governors to use their bully pulpit to communicate about economic impact of the creative sector and arts. Next slide, please. Second, as we all know, it's important to reinforce that we need to identify creative assets that we're basing our strategies on. Next slide, please. Third, we need to build the state infrastructure for partnerships. And this is perhaps the most crucial step at this point in time. It's important to share the message about the importance of integrating the creative sectors with other state policy goals, including economic development, entrepreneurship development, housing and community development, transportation, and many other policy areas. Next slide, please. Fourth, we need to develop local talent and human capital with creative skills. This includes supporting arts-based entrepreneurs and again, there are many more details about these, uh, each of these um, action areas in the report itself. Next slide, please. And lastly, we need to create an environment friendly to investment and innovation. And here there are a variety of recommendations. Next slide, please. In summary, the Rural Action Guide reinforces the principles of investing in this area. As NASA has already documented um, over time, principles such as applying cross-sector problem solving to multifaceted rural challenges. I don't think I need to highlight the process steps for this experienced audience. Next slide, please. And if this were a different audience, I'd also highlight some data to drive home the point of how impactful arts and cultural initiatives can be for states. State cultural districts are impactful. Creative placemaking and house, housing initiatives are impactful. And next slide, please. Cultural heritage and art trails are impactful. And entrepreneurship initiatives, an area which is dear, near and dear to my heart, are impactful. There are actually about 100 examples in the action guide uh, itself. Next slide, please. So if you haven't already, please access NGA's report at nga.org rural arts. It provides access not only to the report itself, but also to state-by-state -state arts and culture data, state videos, and additional resources such as blogs, research, and grants assistance.
Next slide, please. Please feel free to contact me at NGA. My contact information is listed on this slide. And I would just, in closing, I'd like to mention that NGA thanks profusely NEA and NASA again for the opportunity to partner with them on this critically important uh, rural policy area. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Sally, and thank you, Andy, for introducing the report. Um, really interesting stuff, and and I'd like now to talk about the implications of of everything uh, the two of you just presented. Um, so I want to reintroduce Bob Reeder, Program Director at Rural Lisk, Cecily Engelhart, Communications Manager at First Peoples Fund, and Margaret Hunt, Executive Director of Colorado Creative Industries. And we're going to have a, a discussion now, as I said, about um, the implications and um, of the report and, and how um, the report can um, um, make an impact going forward. So I'm going to start off by um, asking a question to uh, Margaret, Bob, and Cecily about their relationship to the Action Guide for Governors and States. Um, could each of you talk a little about the need for rural development you've seen from your perspective, from your organization, and what your organization has been doing to serve rural communities through the arts? Margaret, could you begin by telling us your perspective um, as the director of a state arts agency? Yes, so thank you, um, Paul. Um, we are, our agency is housed within the Office of Economic Development and International Trade. So I, I want to be clear about that because I know that's not the case in many states, although it is in a few. Um, so we work very closely with, um, uh, with our various sister agencies within our department, which include uh, the Office of Tourism, Global Business Development, uh, Outdoor Recreation, uh, and a very newly appointed uh, position of Rural Prosperity Director to advance um, the arts throughout Colorado. And a recent emphasis of our newly elected governor is a focus on rural communities. So I would say um, having a seat at the table is um, the most important thing. And sometimes you have to be a little bit pushy to get that seat at the table. Um, but we need to push. Great, great. Thank you for that. Bob, could you tell us your perspective? Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So, so what I would say, sorry to keep it succinct early, is that uh, last week, uh, Paul and I were on a panel with um, uh, Jamie Bennett of Art Place America, and he introduced a term that I hadn't uh, crystallized in my head, but now I'm going to steal it. It's called case making, the case for what we do. And I feel that this support uh, is just instrument, going to be instrumental in helping folks make the case. Now, what we do, what I do nationally, is we approach community building and, and our interaction with our community partners in rural America from a point of view of providing tools and access to those things that are going to help them uh, do what they do, what they have identified in their communities that need to be done and have them do it better. And, and of our cohorts that do embrace the arts and culture or, and cultural assets as a way of improving their communities, again, this report is going to be a tremendous, tremendous asset. Great. Thank you, Bob. And in case making, that was a, a great term last week. Thank you for bringing that up again. <laughs> And finally, uh, Cecily, could you uh, share, uh, uh, share with us a little bit about what you're seeing from your agency? Yeah, of course. Um, thank you everyone for being here today. And I mean, I'd really like to reiterate what Bob just said about case making. I think that's super important. Um, and something that we've seen is the need to kind of produce some of our own data. Um, because a lot of the data that we see in this report um, is extremely useful. And some of it connects back to this um, framework of assets, you know, asset building in communities, that particular approach. And so for us, especially, you know, being a native focused organization, we're often very much viewed by a, a de deficits based kind of lens. So being able to, to talk about the arts as being such a powerful source of assets for, for our communities 
um, you know, the, the research that we produce in partnership with others has shown that um, uh, about 50% of people make income off of a home-based business. And of that 51%, um, it's 79% of those are traditional art forms. So, I mean, that's nearly, nearly a 40% amount of, of folks who are making income off of, um, off of arts or identify as artists. And so when you think about that as, as an asset and, and looking at this as an asset-based approach and the case-making aspect of everything, um, I feel like this really helps support that and really helps recognize the importance of looking at the unique um, elements in every community. So um, I feel like that's, that's a really excellent perspective to pull from this and the number of resources here that help support that, that perspective. Great. Thank you, Cecily. And, and the number you just threw out there a moment ago, I think that was pretty important. Would you mind reiterating that? Absolutely. So that, that's actually from um, a report we did called Building the Creative Economy, um, and that was focusing kind of on Native artists as um, economic engines. And so what we found was that when we looked at how many people were making income off of home-based businesses, it was about 51% of people. So, you know, we have this idea of um, unemployment rates, but that's really looking at traditional or, or from, I guess, formal employment. So you have 51% of people not not being counted as, as employed in formal employment, but they are making income off of a home-based business. And then you have 79% of those people making income off of traditional art forms. So that's everything from um, quilt work to, um, you know, regalia making to quilting to all of these different forms of artwork that are really prominent in, in Native communities. And so that really shows an opportunity for um, supporting a very large portion of the population uh, economically, but also culturally. Great. Thank you. Thank you for talking a little more about that. And I just want to mention that the literature review that NASA did in support of the Rural Action Guide does uh, summarize the report that Cecily was mentioning. So if you go to NASA's homepage, from there you can link to our Rural Prosperity page, and on that page you can connect to the National Governors Association Rural Action Guide, Governor's Guide, um, as well as to our field scan and um, um, literature review and a paper summarizing nationally available quantitative uh, data sources. So those are all um, resources that you may find helpful. So thank you. Um, I'd like to come back now to Margaret and um, to talk about the policy implications of the report, uh, particularly policies that are realized through partnerships, interagency partnerships. And I was wondering if you could talk about how Colorado Creative Industries has been working with other state agencies, and I'm specifically thinking about your Space to Create Colorado program. Could you tell us a little about that and how it came about? Sure. So um, our Space to Create program, which is designed specifically for rural communities, is to advance permanently, a permanently affordable live workspace for creative sector workers. And this really came about through the leadership of one of our foundations, the Betcher Foundation here in Denver. Uh, the Betcher Foundation had been, had been funding our creative district program. And when we took data to them uh, and showed that um, when creative districts were successful, gentrification was starting to occur, even in rural communities. And our creative sector workers and artists um, we're finding it difficult to find affordable space, both housing and workspace. So it was really the leadership of a private foundation um, uh, that, that brought us to the table and said, let's address this issue. And they got behind it um, very strongly financially and, um, and through, uh, through leadership. So they brought together a number of state agencies to collaborate on this project. Um, one thing I will say I think that's been very important is we realized early on that we were going to have changes in administration, both at the governor's office and in the governor's cabinet. So we developed a memorandum of understanding uh, between our state agencies on this collaboration and had them sign it so that 
we could um, continue to advance the initiative and really institute in state government. Um, trying to think what else. Um, I, I will also, I'd also like to say that the new governor came out with um, what he called bold primary goals for all state agencies to collaborate on and work together. And they included early childhood education, reducing health care costs, 100% renewable energy by 2040, and rural economic development. So we continue to have a cross-cabinet discussions, task force, and collaborations around these issues. Um, and he, especially the task force on rural economic prosperity, um, it includes uh, the Department of Local Affairs, the Office of Economic Development, Colorado Creative Industries, the Main Street Program, the Department of Transportation, Tourism, Department of Agriculture, and the uh, Energy Office. Great, thank you, Margaret. That's that's wonderful to hear that there are so many uh, government leaders um, committed to this work as well as um, private foundations. Um, that, that's really something. And, and finally, uh, Cecily, I'd like to um, talk about your perspective um, um, of supporting tribal communities. Um, I know you're doing a number of projects that are really innovative, um, and I'd like to hear a little more about um, some of the programs that First Peoples Fund has been doing, uh, in particular, Rolling Res, which is a fascinating effort. Could you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, so um, I just want to give a real brief kind of overview of what our organization does kind of as a whole. Um, we're based out of South Dakota, out of Rapid City, South Dakota, where um, a Native women-led nonprofit organization that's been around for um, about 25 years. And um, we're primarily serving rural communities. And, um, you know, we, we serve communities from Maine to Maui, as we say. So we're, we're working um, to provide things like professional development training, technical assistance, um, grants, different things like that all across the nation. But um, a large portion of our work is, is based in Western South Dakota. So of the things that we do in Western South Dakota, um, we have some pilot projects that are really focused on kind of testing out um, you know, testing out the waters of what's potential, uh, what, you know, what is potentially viable for a community um, when you look at their specific assets and their specific challenges. Um, and then additionally, how you, how you can partner with others to address those concerns in, in kind of a systemic and comprehensive way. So the Rolling Reds Arts Bus that's pictured here, um, this is a project that has been kind of years in the making. It's in its fourth year now. This will be its fourth summer um, kind of on the road. And, you know, it's taken a number of partnerships to, to bring this into fruition. We have a partnership with ArtSpace, um, additionally a partnership with Lakota Funds, which is the first uh, native CDFI, um, and then also with uh, the Lakota Credit Union. And so this space, is not only serving as a mobile arts classroom where we teach um, a wide variety of arts classes ranging from you know quill making to um, filmmaking to to um, moccasin sewing to you know you name it cradle board making um, it also serves as a place for us to do professional development trainings um, to to partner with Lakota funds and the the Lakota Federal Credit Union to provide banking services, so it's a mobile bank. Um, and then additionally, um, it does a number of other things like a film camp in the summer. Um, and because, because of the challenges of rurality, um, especially in Native communities where there has been, you know, historic policy that has led to us really often not having basic infrastructure, um, this is a way to address those challenges of being, you know, usually either underbanked or not banked at all communities. We're, we're addressing that by being able to provide um, banking services, but also, you know, the challenge of transportation where we're creating an opportunity for people to not have to leave their community to drive an hour to access a paper to access a class. Um, and then the last kind of piece that I think is really astounding about 
um, the Rolling Res Arts Bus is we have a partnership with a local gift shop um, on the reservation, and they actually do wholesale purchasing from artists, which is huge because otherwise artists are having to drive long distance to pay that gas for the potential of maybe selling, you know, at one location. And if they don't, then they have to drive somewhere else to potentially sell one piece, right? With a wholesale purchaser, they can you know, stay in their community, create a lot of product, bring it, and then have all of their jewelry or multiple quilts or whatever it might be that they're looking to sell purchased in one fell swoop. Um, and that's just one day a month, and that usually puts about $3,000 a month into the community. So, um, you know, this to me is just a really, really creative example of looking at assets and challenges, partnering with other institutions to kind of come up with a creative solution, um, and one that's really rooted in what community is already invested in um, and, and really needs. Is there anything else you'd like me to, to say on that? Oh, thank you, Cecily. I'm sorry I had muted myself for a second. Uh, that was wonderful. Thank you for all of that. Um, Bob, um, I'd like to turn now to you and to talk about your multiple hats, uh, working for Rural Risk and also your work um, at the local level throughout South Carolina. And I was hoping um, you could talk a little about um, your perspective uh, working, as I said, with Rural Risk, which is a community development financial institution. And um, in particular, I'd like to know um, how local government and community leaders could use the action guide. Okay, so I'll, I'll start with the uh, former uh, uh, first, and that is, uh, as you pointed out, uh, LISC uh, is a QDFI, Rural LISC is a program of, of LISC, and LISC has been around for, actually we just celebrated our 40th uh, uh, anniversary uh, celebration a couple of nights ago. Uh, but uh, the rural program, which I'm a part, has been around since 1995. And what we do is, as LISC stands for, for those in the audience who, who may not be aware of us, uh, it's, it's an acronym for Local Initiative Support Corporation, which means that we are a corporation that supports local initiatives. So we don't helicopter in with ideas. Our perspective is that rural communities know best what works for their communities. And so our mission is to provide the uh, resources and investments that allow them to do what they do better. And so our approach to uh, culture and uh, cultural-based economic development, arts and culture-based economic development, was pretty much from a community development perspective, one in which we were trying to uh, come up with just additional arrows in our quiver as to what really works uh, uh, at the local level. And, and so what we try to do is um, uh, again, uh, have local communities, local organizations with which we work. We're in 44 states, almost 2,000 rural counties, and we're trying to um, uh, have them come up with what problems most afflict their communities and how can those problems be addressed. We found from a national perspective that in many rural areas, we all know most of the issues, out migration, aging populations, uh, aging infrastructure, you know, uh, extractive economies that are on a decline. You could go on and on and on. But we also found that there was a, a, a real palpable sense that the people who lived there wanted to stay and wanted their children to stay. In order to do that, they had to come up with strategies that, had, that helped them uh, accomplish that mission, one of which was to sort of address the visions. Many of our, uh, when I grew up, and I did come from South Carolina, grew up here, one of the things we used to have a, a, as a colloquialism was family fights are the deepest. And so just to expand upon that, so in local communities, risks are really, really personal. And sometimes those risks get in the way uh, oftentimes of, of, of there being community-based progress. Arts and cultural, approaching uh, development, economic development, community development from a cultural asset base, uh, uh, what is our narrative? How can our narrative be positive? That's what we try to do. We've worked with, um, I don't know, about, for about three years, we're going into a fourth year of having a, a, a grants program that pretty much um, works from three particular focuses, foster community cultural development, transform physical environments and culturally relevant ways, and to create arts-related economic clusters. And the last one is really important because, after all, as this uh, report points out, 
we have to be able to make the case that these are is, uh, of activities that um, do uh, economically contribute to the community. Now, local communities. I think that local communities can really use this report in a, in, in a number of ways. I'll start with our, uh, 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 you know, our allies. Our allies can, can take it who are, who are already on the ground in town councils and county, uh, admin, you know, county councils can say, look, here's the proof that we've been looking for. Uh, the skeptic can really, I think, benefit from having three preeminent national organizations put their, um, their, their footprint on uh, or their namesake on these works. Here is the empirical data that works. Then I think for local people, uh, the citizens of those communities, they too, or we too can use the report in, in, in both of the above ways. We can say, here, here is ammunition. Here is what we know to be true. Here's what's been found to be true. And we can use that to build partnerships. In, in, uh, and we have to work through partnerships, and uh, we'll probably get to that a little bit later, but Without the relationships and the partnerships, not any of this would be possible, and this helps um, uh, drive that um, uh, that result. Great, thank you, Bob. The next question I'm going to uh, post to all of you, um, and, and that's. How do you fund this work? There's lots of great examples in the Action Guide for Governors of um, programs leveraging the arts in the creative sector to support rural economic development and rural creative placemaking. Um, and I think many of those examples could be replicated throughout the country. Um, but of course, funding is always one of the biggest sticky wickets. How does that happen? Um, so you've given some examples of, of grants and, and uh, partnerships um, that um, provide funding. Um, but more particularly, I want to talk about um, framing the program when seeking funding, um, an arts-based rural economic project. Does that project seek funding from rural-focused agencies and foundations, from art-focused agencies and foundations, from both? And is there um, uh, how how do you present the project? Um, so agencies and foundations from multiple sectors can understand it. So uh, Margaret, could I turn first to you? Sure. Uh, so we utilize um, a, a, a combination of sources of funding, including uh, local, state, uh, federal. Um, you know, federal includes, of course, the NEA, uh, USDA, the Economic Development Association, EDA, and, and federal housing funds. Um, We've, um, we also leverage that with, with private sector and philanthropy, including uh, community and family and private foundations. We've um, also established relationships with businesses. Um, and we're working with our foundations to, um, with a result of shared investment strategies for rural communities specifically. So I would say my primary responsibility in all of this is, is in a leadership role to identify potential partners, bring them to the table, make the case for what we're doing, and um, encourage them to commit their resources to projects. So regarding local sources of funding, um, they're, very, they're varied, and they're based on uh, local community assets, which can include things like um, and this is one that I think many states will begin to look at, uh, sales tax revenue from cannabis, um, lodging tax, uh, business improvement districts, city and county uh, government and line item appropriations, uh, retail and, and uh, chambers of commerce associations, as well as colleges and universities. So um, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's spending other people's money and le leveraging our small budget uh, effectively to uh, bring those partners to the table. 
Great, thank you. That, that, those are uh, a series of really great examples, and of course that one that uh, is particular to Colorado and Massachusetts and Washington State and a few other states, but I think will become more prevalent as a, a source of revenue. Um, Bob, um, could you talk about um, um, the same question about the funding issue? Sure, sure. And Margaret, thank you for those. Those are really great examples. But uh, in some, again, the whole thing about uh, which tables we're around and, and what the receptivity is, uh, some, uh, yeah, we got a long way to go in, in, in some parts of, the, of rural America to get to some of those progressive sorts of uh, examples, but I really found them fascinating. But so for me, I'm going to be a little more um, uh, a general, but also kind of particular as well. We just need to um, uh, look outside of our own silos and not think of our projects as being arts projects. Uh, and, and, and from a macro point of view, critically examine the funding opportunities, the funding, the, uh, 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 the funding opportunities that we may just keep turning the page on. Uh, and and that, for instance, if I, if I receive, and I do receive the uh, Foundation Center uh, PND in, uh, into my uh, feed on, on my email, if I just look for arts and cultural funding, I'm going to miss about half of the opportunities that may be applicable to a project that I might be looking at if I know how to frame it. Um, and Margaret, you mentioned USDA, that's a great one. Uh, states Art Councils, of which you're a part, that's, that's, that's a great one. Um, hum states Humanities Councils, that's another good one. And then on a local level, just sort of figuring out where in the local uh, budgets uh, we could then create relationships through our civic engagement opportunities so that when, when things do come up that, uh, that we need to uh, make our case at, that we're there and know what language to use and what's the appropriate entry point for us to, to, to make that case. Great, thank you. Thank you for that, Bob. And, and Cecily, finally, um, I'm curious about your perspective on this issue and also um, if, if there's, um, maybe you could also discuss um, whether anyone on the phone who's interested in working with tribal communities in their own state, how they might be able to best do that. And, and uh, perhaps you could talk about um, um, any possibilities for how um, people in agencies or other organizations around the country from Maui to Maine, as you said, uh, would be able to reach out to First Peoples Fund um, for funding tribal community projects. Yeah, so um, I think a couple of things. I appreciated everything um, that Bob and Margaret had to say because I really feel like the funding sources uh, have the potential to be very wide, and we as arts organizations, um, you know, we should not silo ourselves in that capacity because we do offer a lot in a way of um, sustainable community development and, and really thinking about what role the arts, you know, as, as varied as they are, serve in communities. Um, I think one of the main things that's coming to mind for me is thinking about um, relationships and partnerships both in widening kind of who you know that that who we who we can appeal to in what we're doing but additionally um that kind of community asset mapping um is one thing but coming together with a strategic approach about uh having consensus in regions i think is super important and, and can be used to um kind of reiterate and, and affirm to funders that what you're doing as an organization is part of a larger plan. So, um, you know, I think we've done that with the Rolling North Arts and, and also with the Oglala Lakota art space that will be opening um, towards the end of this year, early next year. But, you know, I also I have previous experience working in um, community development and, and creative placemaking, if you will, where, um, you know, Pine Ridge recently within, what was this, maybe six years ago, they, they were designated a promise zone. But part of that designation also came from having um, what was called the Oyate Omanichie, which was the Oglala Lakota Regional Plan. And that came from really pulling people from all kinds of different agencies together um, and coming up with a set of priorities and coming up with things that the, that the community really saw as being essential to you know, the future and, and to what everyone wanted to achieve collectively. And so I think that we already do that work in, in um, as arts agencies and, and, and as folks who understand the importance of um, supporting community and supporting unique uh, 
assets and challenges that we all have in, in addressing those. Um, but that consensus, I think, really, really helps uh, funders understand that you are part of a larger picture. You're part of a larger movement. You're part of something that is going to create that ripple effect and systemic change. So that's one thing. And then thinking about um, involvement in tribal communities, I think, you know, we're t already talking about honoring the uniqueness of, of every community and, and approaching it from, from that perspective that we can't necessarily parachute things in and expect, um, you know, something here to be replicated elsewhere. And I think that's extra important when we're talking about Native communities because that there is such a profound history of the happening, especially in relation to economic development. And so being able to really have community-guided work happen um, if folks are interested in supporting or partnering with tribal communities, really honoring that voice that's being expressed, even if it feels different from your perspective or your understanding of economic development, um, because we, you know, we have we do have a different perspective, and we do have reasons for those perspectives that are rooted in who we are, rooted in our relationships to land, rooted in, in our spiritual practices, and so that would kind of be a big thing for me. And then lastly, thinking about policy. Um, policy is a huge challenge, not just for, you know, all of us, but really for Native, Native communities who are um, political status is so unique, be, being independent nations, but still being dependent sovereigns. And so I think we have uh, um, very particular challenges in being able to move policy, but um, there's some benefits to, to having that kind of independent nation status. Uh, but land complicates everything, um, you know, people seeing us as high-risk investments complicates everything. And so I think being a voice and being an advocate for Native communities is one of the, the most powerful ways to kind of help shift narratives because, we, you know, when we're talking about Native people, there are certain things stacked against us. When we're talking about arts, there's definitely certain things stacked against us as well. So kind of that intersection of being able to recognize how valuable art is um, in the mainstream, but also how clearly, um, almost you know, to a much larger degree, art is important in Native communities um, it is really an essential aspect of, uh, of being able to, to work effectively, um, either in partnership or within Native communities. Well said. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Cecily. And and um, that tees up my final question for you. Um, and I think you you framed it really well. That context is important. Culture is important. Local history is important, and that needs to be recognized um, for successful projects in tribal communities, but in other communities as well. The Rural Governors Action Guide addresses that. Um, that's a, a strong theme throughout. Um, authenticity of community as the driver of a project is really important. You can't just parachute in a model from elsewhere and expect it to work um, without any tweaks, without any consideration of what's happening on the ground. Um, and Bob, you addressed that uh, as well when you were talking about breaking out of silos, um, about finding connections across sectors um, and disciplines. So the final question for all of you is, <clears throat> of the many different types of cross-sector collaborations and partnerships um, that can be utilized to support rural economic development, um, what do you see as working best or what has been um, uh, for you the most surprising? Has it been art and agriculture, art and transportation, art and health care, um, whatever? Um, Margaret, how about you? What has been surprising or, or really impressive to you? Well, I think the fact that the governor appointed um, a rural economic prosperity task force of cabinet members and their staff um, was a surprise. Um, because I think in the past there's been a lot of talk about it, but this was a really serious, like, putting a stake in the ground. And, and it includes representatives like, of course, the Office of Economic Development, but agriculture and transportation and education and health care and, and energy. So um, 
we're beginning to see, you know, first of all, that these agencies are discovering, um, they're learning about each other because it's, it's not very often that they do cross-sector collaboration. I mean, they're pretty <laughs> much hunkered down in their silos, right, doing yeah. what they're specifically supposed to do. And so it's created this um, incredible sense of um, enthusiasm and excitement. Um, so, so I think that's been a surprise. Um, and, and then what it has forced us to do and me to do is to do, um, do some research and learn more about, for example, the governor wants to reduce health, health care costs. Um, so we're now providing input to the Department of Health on how arts benefit patients and caregivers and systems that provide health care and reduce costs. So well, I'm starting to look at some, um, some national data around this and, and have learned that, um, that, that including the arts uh, in health care, it shows a 24% improvement in clinical outcomes. It's a $56 billion a year savings uh, in healthcare costs and increased immunity for those battling terminal diseases. So this collaboration is in its early stages. Um, six months ago, I would never have thought that we'd be delving into reducing healthcare costs as part of a strategy in a state arts agency. Hey, that's a that's also surprising, but that's a, a great surprise. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, Bob, how about you? Well, uh, yeah, thank you. But this teases me up to get to the other uh, 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 driving uh, force in my life right now, which is the Art of Community Rule SC. In terms of these sort of innovative collaborations, um, it's actually listed in the report um, uh, on, on one of the pages. I, will, I think it's page 23, but it talks about how we are investing, I think the, the, the most surprising, and use the word surprising, uh, uh, cross collaboration has been not just with health, and that, that's been really surprising, uh, uh, but we've sort of broadened it from the bottom to invest in local leadership. And so our initiative fits on several of those uh, 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 cross, cross connecting sectors, you know, literacy, education, health, uh, uh, blight. Um, you know, a removal, small business development and preservation, each of those that were uh, arrived at from the local communities themselves, and, and by and large by people who didn't know each other before, and in communities that were polarized. And, and, and since I'm in the South, I'll say here is race, but that's not the case in other parts of the country I've worked in. It can be intergenerational, the millennials moving from the city and moving out to the country and wanting to take the city with them, which is not always a bad thing, but the farmers were there too. Um, you know, and then it could be social and, and social economic, the largest landowner, the largest cattle rancher, and the people who have less. And so, uh, but bringing those kind of folks together in a coordinated effort to say, again, as I mentioned before, this is your community. What might, how can we help you design? We don't have any answers. How can we help you? in uh, coming up with and executing a plan for uh, community revitalization and then human connected. We, we found that uh, just by bringing these uh, new leaders to the table, we've been able to create fantastic synergy among people who, I'm not gonna say it's all about us, but we've pretty much been instrumental in getting folks who didn't even speak to each other as communities. You know, there was this nine to five, I call it nine to five integration. You know. We go to work in the morning, we go, but at, after five, they're separate communities, and that's the way it is until eight the next morning and nine the next morning. We are working to change that, not because we're saying we have to change that, but these arts and culture-based projects are doing that organically, and that's the beauty of this reaching out to this new sort of way of working from the ground up. Well said. Thank you. And Cecily, finally, um, how about um, some surprising or, or really impactful uh, collaborations you've seen? So in reflecting on what both Bob and Margaret have said, there's a couple of things that are coming to mind. And I think about that, you know, Bob, what you're referring to in this kind of, um, you know, the, the nine to five integration. I think that's a really interesting Perspective, especially being here in, in what we call 
a, a border town and in relation to towns that are near reservations. Um, so I'll just briefly mention a couple of things. One is last year there was a study completed by First Nations Development Institute and Echo Hawk Consulting um, in partnership with others uh, called Reclaiming Native Truth. And that's the most comprehensive study that's ever been done on perceptions of Native people. And, you know, the, the findings from that were that most people don't think we exist. Um, and the, that the people who do think we exist, you know, are folks in border towns. And, and that's where those relationships become really, really tense. And um, so I think one of the really magnificent things about artwork, although, you know, we could say that art can be controversial, it can be a lot of different things. Things, it certainly is a point at which we can have dialogue. And so thinking of things on that larger picture, um, I think art is a, an opportunity for po people to be able to have conversations, to interact and to collaborate in a way that feels like an invitation into learning more about each other. Um, and then additionally, art is also a way for us to reclaim that knowing of ourselves as Native people. Um, because our, that, was our, that was our method of data collection. That's how we gain knowledge about our land, about our history, about our people, um, through you know, making robes, winter counts, holds, through ceremony, through all of these different things. And all of those had knowledge contained within them. So in this process of reclamation, um, we are learning to be able to communicate ourselves in a way that um, helps people better respect and better understand us. Um, and so with that kind of in mind, um, I guess, you know, the cross-sector cross collaboration aspect of everything, um, you know, I see that on an organizational level from the work that we do, but I also really see it on an individual level from the artists that we support. Um, and like everyone has been saying in relationship to improving health, in relationship to economic development. There's all these different examples that we have, um, and I'll just mention a couple of them very briefly. For one, um, the artwork you see on the side of the bus is by an artist named Don Montalo, and he recently, um, in addition to the beautiful, beautiful work that he does as um, a ledger artist and as a painter, he actually has multiple children's books that are in Lakota. And um, he, he's working in a partnership with education and with the schools to get these books, um, you know, to uh, elementary school aged kids. There's an entire kind of movement around that here in Rapid City. Um, so that's one example of, kind of working with education, revitalizing language, um, the, the way that art is doing that. We also have um, Bethany Yellowtail as one of our former fellows, um, and she really pushes this kind of valuing um, ourselves and our artwork as Native people and has the D Yellowtail Collective who's partnered with um, other entities to produce, you know, Native designed and, and uh, Native created work. Or, um, for instance, Louis Gong from Ace of Generation. He's another one of our fellows who um, started painting on man's shoes. And eventually people were so drawn to what he was doing and wanted to pay him to, to create shoes for them, he started his own company. Um, and now they do uh, contests for blanket designs that are produced by a Native company. And so you have Native people from all over the country um, really getting involved in something that one person created. And these range all over the place from, you know, education to, to economic development to wherever. Um, but it, it also is reinforming people's understandings of who we are and that shifting that narrative is so important because we are typically so invisible even in conversations about diversity and equity and inclusion um, and so to me that's kind of the surprising aspect of this is um, every single moment that we have an artist informing work and partnerships it's an opportunity for people to better better understand um, you know, the nearly 600 indigenous nations that existed, you know, in, in the, within the United States. Great. Thank you, Cecily. Um, uh, really well said. And um, I just want to echo um, something you said a, a few minutes ago about art um, being the way through communities can know themselves. Um, that's, that's a powerful statement. Um, 
you know, to extrapolate that art is how communities can become better selves, how can they can um, get ahead and, and fully realize um, community goals and dreams. I, th I think that's really something. Um, well, I'm going to um, bring uh, this portion of the conversation to a close, and we uh, want to open up uh, a question to the audience. And, and unfortunately, I think we're going to only have time for one or two because we're getting uh, close to the end of our uh, web seminar. Um, so one question that's come in is directed to Bob, and that is, Bob, I like what you said about rural communities knowing best, uh, but what do you do if they don't know that? How do you draw out knowledge from rural communities? It's a, I would say be patient and it's a process and be willing to, to, to listen uh, at first a lot because there's something there. We just may not be able to, from our own perspective, know what it is right then. But I think, again, patience and listening and being able to, 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 to be there. I know that sounds sorely elliptical, but that's the only way to do it. You've got to get trust. Um, it's not my statement. Uh, the uh, director of the South Carolina Arts Commission, the guy named Ken May, uh, brought it to my attention, but he said it's not even his. But change moves at the pace of trust. So, mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, something I didn't forget when, when I heard it mentioned. So, yeah, it just it takes a while. <laughs> Got it. Change moves at the pace, pace of trust. That's, I like that. That's a, that's a, a wise thing to say. Um, great, thank you. Um, the next question is for Margaret, and this uh, question is about Colorado Creative Industries Cultural Districts Program. And the question is, um, why is it valuable to have state leadership in a cultural districts initiative? Um, do state arts agencies help communities leverage their efforts? Um, more so than if they worked independently. Um, Margaret, could you speak to that a little? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, I think it's a really good question. And uh, one of the things, one of uh, the reason we got into this business of creative districts is is through legislation that um, was uh, authored by a legislator who really saw the value of supporting creative districts that were kind of informally started within neighborhoods that she served. And, and the legislation uh, uh, obligated us to certify creative districts, to give them state certification. And so that prompted us to look at what we thought were the, um, the best practices and the highest standards uh, for creative district and to set, uh, set those institutionalized and, and create those. And so really what it, what, it, what it helped to do was provide these districts with a vision for how they could improve and where they could go and what things would be possible. Um, and so, so it's now what, what we're doing is um, really helping communities to see this as an economic and community development strategy. So I'll give you an example of a rural community. Um, Ridgeway, Colorado has a population of 900 people. They really struggled with economic development, really getting their heads around what could a community this small do as, a, as an economic development strategy. And once they started looking at creative district and the certification to be a creative district, it suddenly made sense to them as an economic development strategy. And so um, uh, that, was a, that was pretty profound. And, and, and what, they, what we required them to do uh, one of the steps is to prove concentration of creatives. And so they began doing that, that field work in their community and they discovered that 12% of their population were uh, employed and in creative pursuits, which was um, very surprising to them. So then they had the bones of, of really be a, being able to say this makes sense for our community. So, so we're also able to convene so, so we really strongly um, uh, recommend the role of a state arts agency as a convener. We convene our creative districts. We now have 23 that are certified. 
Uh, there were two six years ago, so it's been an, a wild, wildly popular community and economic development strategy. We convene them twice a year. We provide them with access to resources. We make introductions. They've become their own learning community, and they're beginning. At, they have, they're doing a great job of supporting each other and helping each other solve problems. So I think that's the real value of the state state's role. Great, thank you. I appreciate that. And finally, we have uh, time for just one quick question, and, and that's for Cecily. Um, and that's, uh, Cecily, uh, could you tell us where to find the report you mentioned, Reclaiming Native Truths? Yeah, absolutely. And that is actually, let me double check the web actual. I mean, you can you can look up Reclaiming Native Truth. I want to say it's rnt.firstnations. Yeah, it's rnt.firstnations.org. Um, and that's a really phenomenal resource because not only do they have kind of a executive summary of their research, but then they also have um, a guidebook for allies. They have one for media. They have one for Native people and organizations. Um, it's a really phenomenal resource with a lot of great information. Similar, you know, to to the um, Rural Action Guide, I think, like, the, the starting point for me when, when I think of these resources as if people aren't sure where to start, you can start here, and that's a jumping off point to be able to really um, make some informed decisions about the trajectory of your work. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for that. And that's a nice wrap up to our conversation to start with another starting point. I like that. Uh, thank you. Um, so I want to uh, thank Bob Reeder from Rural Risk, Cecily Engelhart from First Peoples Fund, and Margaret Hunt from Colorado Creative Industries for a good conversation. I also want to thank again Sally Rood from the National Governors Association and Andy Mathis from the National uh, uh, um, um, Endowment for the Arts um, for discussing um, how the report came about and how and, and what is in it. Um, and I'd like to close out today's conversation by just reiterating that the Action Guide for Governors and States on Rural Prosperity is available directly from NASA's homepage. Um, our web address is NASA N A S A A dash arts, A-R-T-S, dot org. And on the homepage, there is a carousel uh, rotating left to right. And from there, you can click on our Rural Prosperity page. And the National Governance Association Action Guide is available there, as well as the research that NASA did to support it, which is a 50-state rural, 50-state uh, scan of uh, rural um, economic development through the arts programs, a related literature review and a collection of quantitative, national level quantitative data sources that can support work in this realm. So again, thank you all for joining us today and I wish you a good weekend and good work. Thank you, take care. <laughs>